welcome to gagrul.net. This is Gagrul Live on Facebook. Today we have uh, Harut Sasunian. I know you all know him. He's, a, he's the best writer in Armenia on, in diaspora. And uh, he's a publisher and among many things. He's a president of Armenia Artsakh Fund and uh, lots of stuff. You know, he's been doing this all his adult life. And uh, Harut, welcome. Thank you, Wally. Nice to be with you. So what is your update in all this fiasco we are going through? You know, 44 days of Pashinian lie and 45 days of um, capitulation. And now he wants to be a prime minister again. What is your take on that? Yeah, well, unfortunately, uh, as I've said before, uh, he bottom line is, is in one word is uh, incompetent uh, he cannot uh, lead a country uh, I'm not sure he can lead anything uh, let alone a country and uh, anybody with some uh, sense of decency would have immediately resigned on on the day that the war was over but he refused to resign and he's uh, stuck to his chair and his power and uh, even though he came to power uh, under the principle of democracy and the people's will, but uh, he doesn't listen to anybody. A uh, lot of the organizations, parties, the two Gatorgoses, political parties, organizations in Armenia, tens of thousands of people, they're all asking to resign, but he refuses. He keeps saying that uh, I will resign when the people tell me. But the people are telling him, but he says, those are not people. He means his people. You know, of course, he has lost uh, the 70% popularity down to maybe 30%. But still, there are those who support him for only one reason, uh, because they hate the previous leader so much that they, they're they afraid that if uh, Pashinyan goes, that no old timers will come back. And I keep saying that that's not a good reason to keep an incompetent leader who's doing more damage to Armenia on the top of the damage he did for the last three years on a daily basis, plus the war. And since the war, he's mismanaged just about everything. And he keeps saying that he will uh, correct everything, but the person who ruined everything is in no shape to correct anything. We need a, a fresh face, a new leadership, new approach, uh, so we can put that behind us and try to see what can be done to salvage the the little that we we've left uh, before we lose everything, so that's that's where we are now. Uh, so he, uh, after after again contradicting himself many times, uh, no, there'll be no elections. Then the next day he says yes, there will be elections. No election, election, and finally he announced that there will be elections, and uh, he convinced his people in parliament to go along with it, and he convinced the two major parties that are in the parliament, minority parliament uh, uh, parties, to go along with, with the election. So they decided June 20th, but even that was done improperly and illegally because the person who appoints the uh, date of the election is the president, not the prime minister, not the parliament. But the president didn't have a chance to say anything. They, they were the announced that it's June 20th. And, uh, you know, it's one, one more screw up by Pashinian on top of everything else that he does wrong. He does so many of them that a lot of them get lost in the shuffle. People don't pay attention anymore because they don't know which error to pick on. Uh, so we have an election and under, under Armenian's uh, constitution, uh, the way it works is those, for those who don't know, the uh, parliament has to have a meeting after... Uh, the prime minister resigns, which will uh, be sometime in April. And uh, <clears throat> then uh, the parliament will try twice to elect a new prime minister. Uh, and all three parties, majority and the two minority parties, have agreed not to uh, propose their own candidate. So, which means that after twice trying to elect a new prime minister, the uh, parliament is dissolved. Uh, the government dissolved, but Pashinyan will stay in power as caretaker 
until the election. Uh, and then uh, there'll be election on June 20th. And then depending on what happens in the, in, in the, in the election, the results, the, uh, uh, they will elect a new prime minister. Uh, m my guess is that uh, 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 I disagree with those who say nothing will change. And I also disagree with those who say everything will change. It will be sort of in the middle. Uh, he, right now, he has about 75, uh, 78 members of parliament from his party. In the new elections, my guess is that he will not have that many uh, members of his party elected to the parliament. So he won't have the overwhelming majority as now. So he will have less, less than half of the parliament uh, his members, uh, which means that in order to uh, rule the parliament in the country, he needs to have a coalition partner with one of the parties in parliament uh, or, or, or several of them, if they're all very small, uh, to have a, a decisive majority. And uh, But even though he'll be elected, so that's the good news for him, but it will not be the same power that he has now he now has unchallenged power. He and the overwhelming majority of his party will, will pass anything they want, regardless of what anybody thinks. But when there's a, an, after the new election, when he doesn't have the only majority as now, the, uh, he has to make a deal with the minority parties in, in, in coalition. Now, uh, of course, the minority parties cannot decide anything, but if they don't go along with the uh, Pashinian's proposals and suggestions, then it will not pass. So there's there has to be a compromise, give and take, like in all other countries, we are witnessing what's happening in Israel for the last couple of years. The, they, they can't form a government because none of them have a majority. And they're trying to make a deal with various parties, offering different deals, different ministerial positions, going along with, with whatever they, they think should be done in Armenia. And so Pashtian is gonna sweat a lot more than he is now in order to be able to run the country the way he's used to running. Uh, it's, you know, it's a monopoly of power right now, but it won't be a monopoly after June 20th. You know, like, I just don't understand this guy. Like, you need, you're dealing with Putin, you're dealing with Erdogan, you're dealing with those Azerbaijani Aliyev, those three dictators. They've been around for so long. Pashinian has no business experience, no managing experience, no diplomatic experience, no, no military experience. How is going to go sit down on those pe with those people and negotiate? I mean, we saw that what he did in, uh, in the ceasefire, he just went in there and said, OK, what do you want me to sign? You know, and then uh, the next one, they told him, like, send us your deputy. Our deputy we talk about this, uh, what is his name, uh, open corridor, uh, economic corridor. He's doing that, but he never says anything about Artsakh. We don't know whether Artsakh is uh, Armenian, belong to Russia, belong to Azerbaijan, uh, what's going to happen. He's not even talking about that. And he's just talking, he's trying to entice Armenia with this open corridors are going to be great, Turkish border going to open, all that. He's thinking if he, I think this is advices from Putin and others were saying to him, well, you know, hang in there. Uh, once the economy grow up, the border open, Armenia will forget about this whole thing. In fact, this is what he's playing right now. This is my opinion. Yeah, well, no, you said everything right, but you said uh, quite a few things. Let me respond to some of them. If I were to summarize this whole conversation in, in, in one sentence, here, here's the basic problem of Armenia on top of all the other problems. But the more serious problems are twofold. One, we have a weak country that has lost a war. So you're not in a decision-making uh, position. You're subject to those who won the war, Azerbaijan and Turkey and, uh, and Russia. And... Uh, the second problem, which makes that situation worse, is that we have an incompetent leader. Yes. If we had a competent leader, he would at least try to manage few small things 
to minimize the, the damage and the loss. But when you, ha when you have a weak country who lost a major war and major territory and all those uh, soldiers that we lost, and then the leader cannot lead, cannot manage the problem, that makes it worse. So those are the two major problems we have. Yeah. Now, and this, this guy is in no shape to be able to correct anything, even though he thinks he will. And he talks big, but, but you know, his problem didn't start with the war. The war came after over two and a half years of his rule, uh, his uh, misrule, and uh, he mismanaged everything during those two and a half years, yeah. contradicting everything, saying exaggerated, uh, obnoxious things, and threatening his opposition, and saying one thing, dying, the, doing the opposite, uh, uh, not keeping his promises, not being being able to correct anything in Armenia in the in the two and a half years, like the court system and the corruption, and and, and putting competent ministers, and I mean he's changed ministers several times he uh, he's changed uh, the heads of national security council four times and there's rumor that's going to change for the fifth time in a few days so that's that's one thing secondly in, in terms of uh, azerbaijan and turkey you know it's as i say it's bad enough that we lost the war against more powerful enemies that's bad enough but but you, you can't but unfortunately our Problem is worse than that. We have a leader, Pashinyan, who thinks that those imposed conditions on Armenia are a, are a good thing. He really yeah, likes yeah. the likes the defeated uh, uh, terms of uh, the, the the terms of defeat of the war. He, he thinks that having a uh, the road. Uh, from Azerbaijan to Nakhichevan, he thinks that's a good thing for Armenia. Yeah, he doesn't seem to realize that's a disaster for Armenia. That's the hundred-year-old dream of the Pan-Turanian Turks who wanted to go from Istanbul all the way to Central Asia and China, and have Turkey uh, uh, spread its influence and power all the way to those countries. Uh, Armenia basically will be like a little toy. Uh, already it's a l little country, weak country, and now it will become even worse. So Pashinyan is, talks about this. This is very proud that there'll be a road that it will yeah. give access to Turkey and, uh, and uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, he, he also, after spending his whole political career in, as a member of parliament, being against Russia on every single subject. He was against uh, the common market of the, of the Russian common market. He was against the uh, Russian bases in Gumri. Yeah, he was against uh, Russian investments. He was against everything Russian. But the minute he came to power, he switched. And, and now he, he, he says, I'm not going to change anything. I'm going to keep the policy of Serge Sarkisian as it is. And, uh, and after this war, because he lost the war big time, now he doesn't have a choice but to really ingratiate himself to Putin in every aspect. If Putin tells him jump, he, he's not going to say no. He's going to not only jump, he's going to say how high you want me to jump. Yeah. I'll jump that high. Yeah. So uh, he's, he's become the puppet of, of Putin, but, but he also, unfortunately, has become the puppet of Aliyev and Erdogan. And uh, Ali have, uh, has said that Armenia's leaders can no longer come to Artsakh, Karapakh, yeah. because that's yeah. our territory, even though part of it still is in Armenian hands. And, and Pashinyan, uh, who talks big, ever since the war on, on November 10, he hasn't visited Artsakh once. So he is really carrying out Aliyev's orders. Coming to Erdogan, things are going to get even worse very soon. Because as we know, April 24 is approaching and we have a, a, a commitment from Biden to issue a statement on April 24, recognizing the Armenian genocide. But whether he will do it or not, but separately from that, uh, for Biden to do something or not to do something, that's his decision. Uh, we would we, we'll be happy or not happy with, with that. But it's even worse when our own Armenian leader, Pashinyan, 
starts making deals with Erdogan on the border and, 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 and Biden and his people who are experienced people, they're no fools, they're going to say, oh, uh, it looks like Armenians and Turks are getting along well with each other, opening the border and all this trade. So remember, I don't want to. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to do. Yeah, I, remember so this, trying, this is what they yeah, did. Yeah, you're showing the picture of the 2009 uh, signing of the protocols in Zurich yeah. with Hillary Clinton there, uh, Davutoglu, the Prime Minister of Turkey, and uh, and, and uh, Hillary Hill Hill Clinton Hill. came back says, "Oh, if you recognize Armenian genocide, you're going to torpedo the uh, turkish armenia relationship," and they dropped it. Well, already, already we, we have that uh, today. The uh, advisor uh, of, of Erdogan, uh, Kalin, uh, he, he gave in, uh, he, he spoke with uh, uh, Sullivan, the Biden's national security advisor, and he told him, you cannot, Biden cannot say genocide on April 24, because that would ruin all of the arrangements in the region between the, between the countries. So, uh, I mean, already they're saying it. We don't need even to wait for April 24 to, to find out what they're going to say. We know because we went through this with Obama and, uh, and Serge Sarkisian and the protocols. And that's why I wrote two, two months ago with a very strong headline saying, warning to Armenia's leaders, do not fall in the same Turkish trap again one more time. And, and it looks like we are going to fall in the trap. We don't learn from history. We, we don't know how to manage the present, let alone manage the future. Uh, we have incompetent leadership who doesn't know how to decide anything, whether it's politics or military or economy or relations with other countries. So we're, we're sort of uh, in, in a very bad situation. <clears throat> incompetent, there is no... I hope there was some worse word than incompetent about this guy. You know, like, he even in Armenia is afraid to travel. He, he has a Entourage is like Erdogan, it's becoming like Erdogan, police and security. How is going to manage a small country like Armenia? Everywhere we go, he is going to have uh, hundreds of police and things like that. He's so scared of his life because he knows some people, Armenian, are so angry at him. And so I have no idea how he's going to govern. Well, before he governs, uh, he has to run around the whole country, villages and towns and cities campaigning and everywhere he goes he has to take an entire uh, uh, army of police and he just announced that he's raising their salary by 90% yeah. to win them over and during the election can you imagine at the magnitude of that corruption you call an election and you give police a raise well uh, the, you know that's why the uh, opposition in armenia have been screaming the last few uh, days that he's, he's abusing the resources of, of the government to, to, to run as a candidate. And uh, it's, it's a violation of the constitution, violation of the law. And, uh, but, you know, it's a one man show. And uh, he, like you said, he's like Erdogan, he's like Aliyev, he's like Putin. Uh, this guy who came to uh, power on the principles of democracy has become uh, an absolute uh, a dictator, one man rule. And uh, he does whatever he wants. And if he doesn't get his way, he threatens people. He has investigations. He, uh, none of them have turned up anything so far. But uh, basically, every those people who support, uh, like I had even in my website and other and Facebooks, their their reasoning says, oh. If we don't pick Pashinyan, then this corrupt old will come to power. Well, even that corrupt, they were they were the one, you know, liberated Garabagh. They were the one who kept Garabagh safe. And and this idiot, I I rather anybody come in power, but this guy, this guy is proof himself is very incompetent, you know. So their excuse of this corrupt old corrupt regime will come back and. You know, like his old corrupt regime was such a horrible, worse than this guy now, you know. Yeah, the problem, but the here, problem. Is, here is my, my things, you know. You know, I, I predict stuff pretty good, you know. The difference between Pashinyan and Trump, they're both the same twin brother. They're both liars. They both have uh, egomaniac and that. 
But the reason Trump didn't win because Trump could not uh, bribe and control uh, the the bureaucracy, you know, which they call them deep state, you know, the civil servant stuff. So we were getting lots of leak from Trump administration. In Pashinyan, this is why he's doing it. He's giving raise to the police, the civil servant, the teachers. So he is, this is why in Armenian government, there is no leak. We are, we try to call here, call there to get some leak. Nobody's leaking. And and confirmed report also says, maybe uh, we don't know 100%, he goes into the military headquarters. He said, he tell those military general, if you guys pick this guy that this general he, uh, he appointed, he promised them that he will not do investigation. I don't know if you heard about that or not. Yes, yes uh, you know, the, well, again, a couple of things. One, first of all, in, in terms of him being surrounded by police the only good thing about that there is a, a good thing is because if god forbid something happens to pashinian then there'll be blood in the streets of armenia yes. and it, it'll be really a disaster even worse than now so i i hope nothing happens and i don't mind that he's protected uh, he should be protected so nothing bad happens because we're going to go even worse situation yes uh, so secondly in terms of the military the chief of staff the, right now, Armenia is in a very ridiculous situation. Most people haven't realized this. Right now, we have not one, not two, but three chiefs of staff. Three. So God forbid if there's a war right now, the military would not know who to listen to. They're going to give different orders. We, what we, we have is only Kasparian, who's the military uh, the chief of staff, who uh, general staff who was in charge during the war and since then that Pashinyan tried to fire. And he went to court and filed a lawsuit against Pashinyan and that's pending. And and now the judge is getting a lot of threats because he accepted the, the lawsuit and they're gonna uh, have a trial and make a decision. Uh, but, you know, the uh, this is after uh, Pashinyan saying that judges are free to decide as they want, I'm not gonna interfere. But, but any judge that di disagrees with anything he tries to do, they're in trouble. They get fired or they get threatened. Uh, Bashinian himself had people surround the, the courthouse and would not let uh, people in and out of the courthouse because uh, they, he didn't like their, one of their decisions. But uh, anyway, so there's the chief, existing chief of staff, Onik Kasparian. Then there is the chief of staff, that's uh, Tavitian, that Pashinian has appointed to replace Kasparian. So he's, he's appointed by prime minister. And the third guy is a, is a provisional or temporary chief of staff until they sort out who's in charge. Oh my God, so, I didn't so know we, that. <laughs> we, have, we have three chiefs of staff, which I, I think is first in, in the history of the mankind that the country has three chiefs of staff. Uh, it's bad enough to have one, even the one during the war could not make the proper decision because there was so much interference from the uh, defense minister, uh, from uh, other generals, from Pashinian, who did not know anything about the military. He was giving orders. Uh, Pashinian's wife, who went to the central command in uh, in Shushi and uh, was trying to, uh, you know, it's a place where no non-military people can go in, and when one of the generals uh, said a very soft, mild objection, very soft, uh, uh, the wife uh, informed Pashinian and Pashinian immediately recalled that general in the middle of the war back to Yerevan. So uh, it's, it's a very bad situation and it's getting worse by the day. Uh, a couple of days ago when Pashinian was talking in, uh, in one of the towns uh, giving a speech, Again, he came up with, with another nonsense uh, statement saying that what we want to do is we want to close down all the universities in Yerevan, Yerevan State University and Polytechnic, everything else that belongs to the government. And then we will sell those buildings to business people. And, and then we'll use the money to uh, build an educational city outside of Yerevan, 
where, where all the schools will be in one city. Now, the, this is a ridiculous idea for several reasons, so just quickly. One is the, you cannot build anything because you don't have the money until you sell what you have. But if you sell what you have, then, it, then those universities will be closed down. Then the university students will have no place to get an education. Uh, they, they'll be out of one building and they'll, they'll have no other building to go to until several years from now where they build the new buildings, if they ever build it, uh, and the education minister, who probably was surprised by this announcement, this should have come from him, not the prime minister. He said, well, that's a dream and uh, hopefully one day we'll be able to do this. And then he said, even if we sell the buildings, the money will not be enough to build an entire city for education. Yeah. And lastly, the, a, a, any issue like this, before the prime minister gets up in front of the public and announces it as a done deal, he should consult not only the education minister, consult the, 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 the presidents of the universities, the educators, to see what they think about this idea. They may think it's a good, good idea, they may think it's a bad idea, but there's no consultation. He just gets up and just says whatever yeah. comes to his head <laughs> without knowing That's anything. What dictator is. Yeah. That's what dictator is. And so he's, he's just learning from Putin and, and his buddy Erdogan and uh, Aliyev, and he does that. Yeah, he, you know, the, on a university, the one good thing is in Armenia that every person can go to university because First of all, it's very cheap, like cost maybe a $1,000 whole year or even less. And now you're going to give it to the private industry, they're going to triple the, the price. Private industry is not going to come like a government do uh, nice things. They want to make money. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be all, like the U.S. Also, all the students no longer will be able to live at home in Yerevan and just yeah. go a few blocks away to the university. They have to either travel have a car every day to go back and forth or they have to live in dormitories which also is expensive adds more 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 costs uh our, our people have a hard time even paying the low tuition they have now let alone the more expensive tuition that's gonna come with with the with the new educational city it, it, this is just an example of the type of the level of decision making that uh, Pashinian does on every subject from military to politics to you name it. And, you know, uh, uh, talking about his meetings with Putin and, uh, and uh, Aliyev, uh, we saw that uh, after the November 10 uh, war, uh, three of them met once on January 11 in Moscow. And at that time, Pashinian announced before going to Moscow, that there's only one issue on my agenda, which is the return of the prisoners of war, which is a very important thing for Armenians, having lost their family members and sons. So he goes to Moscow, he sits there for three hours with Putin and Aliyev. I, we don't know what they discussed for three hours, but, but we know what the outcome was. The outcome was that they signed an agreement on how to open the, yeah. the roads between Azerbaijan and Armenia and Russia, and not one word about the prisoners of war. Yeah. Anybody with little two cents of brain would have gone in there and sat there even after losing a war, and it would have said, rightly so, that before we discuss any other subject, we have a memorandum signed by all three of us that the prisoner of war will be released. And so many months have passed, haven't resisted. So I'm not here to discuss any other subject unless first we resolve the prisoner of war issue. Yes. Only after that, I, I'll discuss things. He's always discussing subjects that are in the interest of Russia or Azerbaijan or Turkey, but never in the interest of Armenia. Nothing, zero, zero. And the prisoners zero. are still there since January 11 and since November 10. Well, that's what... Months. That's what I said. That's what I said. He, the guy has no negotiating intelligence in him. He never done anything like that in his life. You know, all of us, we did business, we bought, we sold, you know, we hire. We this guy have done nothing in his life. He got elected only on one word, corruption. That's it. 
He had no foreign policy, no domestic policy, no economic policy, and he just fly over Armenia with that corruption. And today, most Pashinyan supporters that I talk to them, it's exactly the same story. Oh, you want those corrupt uh, Sarkisian and Kocharian come to power? That's what is their, their defense. They cannot defend anything about Pashinyan, but that's what they say. Well, the you know, yes, the previous leaders were corrupt, uh, but the uh, Pashinyan has been now in charge for three years, and he hasn't been able to prove one thing in court. Yeah, uh, he he has been after Kocharian for years, even um, though he came to power. things was not even corruption. It was like he's accusing him of those ten people that the, the violent protest Pashinyan created. So it's nothing to do. If he went in there, confiscated Kocharian uh, mansions and businesses, what will say, okay, he's doing something. He never touched anybody. Well, well, as we know, a couple of days ago, the Constitutional Court ruled that the two articles under which Kocharian was being tried was anti-constitutional. So he basically, the, the court, the Constitutional Court threw the... Uh, the charges out and surprisingly the the judge the little judge of the uh, regular court refuses to comply with the order of the constitutional yeah. court by violating the constitutional court and uh, he she just uh, it's a lady she just uh, postponed the, the next hearing of the court till uh, sometime in april uh, probably she's going to consult and see which way the wind blows from the leadership because if she doesn't rule the right rule, the, she'll lose her job. But, uh, but you cannot violate the Constitution. You can't be a judge and violate the Constitution when the court, and, and, and the court is not the previous court that Serge had. I, I believe that it's three- It's a Pashinian setup. Pash, Pashinian appointed yeah. with parliament majority, yeah. three, yeah. at least three out of the eight and got rid of the the others that were appointed yeah. uh, during Serge time, so even they voted in favor of the ruling that it's anti-constitutional. So you can no longer say these are the old judges. The new judges are also voting the same way. Yeah. It's so clear that it's anti-constitutional. They're trying to uh, judge Pashinian, uh, judge Kocharian, based on a constitutional law that didn't exist back in 2008. It's in the new constitution, not the old constitution. So uh, the, the laws are not retroactive. You cannot punish somebody for a crime that didn't exist when that act was committed. If, if somebody murdered somebody, you know, or, or committed a crime long time ago and there was no law against it, and you have a law now, but you can't go back and charge that person for, for the previous uh, wrongdoing. Make law as it fit. Yeah. Um, the pro whether pro other problem is there is no opposition. I mean, there is no uh, one person that you could put your finger and says, ah, this guy can't compete with them or this guy. I mean, they're all like he he he's very skillfully let it let this protest. Everything goes on. And then he brought this Marukian, his, his Marukian, his buddy, you know, they were one time same party, you know. And well, it, so he comes, he was pushing this election, election. He was against the re resignation. You know, finally, he convinced these two uh, Sarukian and this uh, Marukians and to do this election things. But those are the only things around. There is no other one, you know, in Armenia that... Uh, Armenian people will say, okay, I'm, I know now is this guy from Russia, Armenian union leader, he's uh, getting into this fry. Uh, he's going to make a tour to U.S., other places. And also there is this uh, this guy, uh, uh, I interviewed him twice, uh, um, Ara uh, Bakian. He's a smart guy. Uh, he's he's pre-America Western but I just don't know whether they could make it. I, I just don't know. Like, I mean, he's very smart. He, had a very, he was a diplomat, and he knows the history. 
and uh, Ara Arababian, yeah. Yes, he was a former ambassador. Right. So uh, he's 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 a part of that. Uh, what he calls so it's not so rare, but they have a new name now, Democratic something. I mean, he's he's a credible guy, but I I just don't know like who 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 is there gonna stand up to Pashinyan? You know, maybe you know. Well, I mean, for, first of all, I I don't agree with those who say that if Pashinyan leaves, the old timers will come back, because you know there are three million, close to three million Armenians in Armenia, and those three million are not just Kocharian and Ser Sarkisian. There are a lot of other people, and when when there's election, they will put in their names, they will run for office, and uh, let, let's see who gets elected. Uh, new people will come that were never a candidate before. So the, those who say that we can't let go Pashinyan because others will come, it's an excuse for hanging on to Pashinyan. Yeah. Not because they want somebody better. Uh, if, if, if they're objective, they will say, we want somebody better than the old ones and better than the current one. But Pashinyan's people don't say that. We say, no, we're gonna keep what we have no matter what mistakes he makes, how yeah. bad he is, because the others will come. Well, the other thing about the election is, according to the poll that the uh, USAID did in Armenia about a month ago by now, it shows that uh, even though Pashinyan's party has the highest rating, as like about 30, 32, uh, 33%, and the other parties are much smaller, but the, the most interesting thing that the media in Armenia did not focus on is that 42 or 43% of the public, much higher than Pashinyan's group and all the other parties put together, are saying they're, they're not going to vote for anybody. Not Pashinyan, not any of the parties. Yeah, that's a they're problem. Not gonna, they're not going to even vote. Yes, so, that, so that's if, a big problem. If I was, if, if I was in... Uh, a citizen of Armenia and running in Armenian elections, I would not waste my time in criticizing Pashinyan. I would try to convince the 43% who are much bigger group than Pashinyan's group and others to vote for for, for me or for, for, the, for the person who's, who's running, trying to win them over. That's the majority that's being ignored by everybody. Everybody has their little circle, one, two, three percent. And Pashinyan, who had 70%, is down to now about 30, 35%. Everybody is uh, uh, fighting with each other over the existing followers. They need to go out. There are much more people, much, many more people that don't, don't follow anybody. They don't vote for any party or, uh, or that they're uh, disappointed with all of the leaders, current and past. And uh, they're not going to vote. So... so if, if if somebody is smart uh, in terms of politics, he will come up with new ideas, creative ideas, come up with solutions to the problems and urge a majority of the non-voting, non-involved people to support him. Because if he succeeds, that person is going to be the new leader of Armenia. Do you know anyone? <laughs> well, you know, um, I have some names, but but the problem with, with you know in Armenia these days is, is there's so much hostility among Armenians that any name that I or you or anybody mentions immediately on Facebook, especially, there'll be thousands of attacks on that person, uh, lies and vicious attacks, and they try to destroy that person's reputation. Yeah. Uh, so. I'm reluctant to mention any name because that person is going to come under attack immediately by either those who are currently opposition or those who are currently Pashinyan supporters. Uh, I, I just uh, will let the people themselves put their candidacy in the election. And, and you know, the, the, the other problem we have, which I, I mentioned briefly, is right now, Armenia is, has a load of very serious problems. Yet neither Pashinyan, who's in charge and that's his job to do, nor the opposition who's trying to overthrow him and take over, uh, win over the majority by elections, neither one of them, opposition or leadership, are 
proposing solutions to Armenia's problems. You, you can't just say, vote for me. And people are not that stupid. People look, see, if somebody is saying something intelligent, is solving their problem of getting a job, uh, having a, a better society, uh, having safety, security, what? You're, you're cutting from your side, I don't know if it's your Nobody's side. Nobody's proposed vote. You're cutting. Oh, okay. It was cutting off. Yeah, the internet is going in and out. Okay. Uh, I think we're back. We're, we're okay now. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I think even the media in Armenia, they do more commentary than, you know, exposing stuff or asking some tough question. I mean, I don't know. They do in Armenia, so I don't know too much. Don't understand their accent, la language. And sometimes when I hear it, I think the, the media in Armenia so, should expose more of this Pashinian stuff or or ask some tough questions. And so, but he's not giving interviews anyway. So he's only one time he gave interview and he got in big trouble. Yeah, well, the, the media, unfortunately, has a lot of problems. Uh, mostly in Armenia, but also even in the diaspora, because w the media violates the basic rule of journalism, which is you give objective professional news in all of the pages of, of your newspaper or on TV. And then there's something called editorial or commentary or uh, opinion columns, op opinion editorials called op-ed, where you give the uh, editor's views or the newspaper's views in that one editorial. But frequently what we see is all of the papers, they mix their own opinion with the news they're giving. So you cannot have a objective news that's not biased, that's not pushing a particular agenda. You know, in, uh, I'm a journalist and in my newspaper, I never mix my opinion, not once in the last 40 years that I've been editor, uh, with, uh, with my opinion. I, I give the news in all the pages, and there's one column uh, in the paper where I give my, my personal opinion there. And people can agree with me or disagree. And my name is on that one column, and people know that's my opinion. But the rest of the articles, whatever happens in Armenia, whether I like it or don't like it, I never try to bias it or uh, color it certain way so to give a particular message to people. The, I try to, give, to verify the information, try to give news and uh, educate the people on what's going on. And people are smart enough, they, they'll reach their own conclusion. Uh, I, I, that, that's the way journalism should be. Unfortunately, uh, many of the Armenian uh, Journalists do not operate like that. Yeah, I think they need some tough, tough journalism. Even during war, you know, like I was con in contact with some people, they were just, they were afraid to say anything because Pashinyan was telling them, uh, don't, you know, I remember vividly, I was talking to in the border communities and one of them was in uh, Khanzoretz, this lady, and this was, I think, October 19 or 20. And before that, I was talking. She was saying, you know, no, nothing, not much happened. Happened to be her husband was in the, uh, on, uh, on the war zone. And she said every time we talked to him, he would just say, how is my son doing? How is my son doing? He would not say anything. And then uh, as come to 19 and 20, she said, he, she said we hear the bombs. It's not too far from us. And that's where I knew Azerbaijan It's That's where uh, I think it's Hardut or those who are so close to uh, Sunik and that areas. And, and that's why I know Armenia is in trouble, you know. And, um, but the media was not reporting anything. And, we, and I was afraid to even mention it because Pajinian, because we were sort of loyal uh, not to say anything, uh, 
uh, they were saying, listen to uh, uh, the, the source, government source and things, but it was too late, you know. Well, you know, this example that you gave, that's not really the, the fault of the media. The Armenian government uh, passed a law saying that journalists cannot report anything that they find. They have to just repeat the government's announcements. Yeah, yeah exactly. So and if anybody violated, there will be punished. There will be penalty. So journalists were on the, on the front lines observing that the Azeris were advancing. But they could not say that. They could not show that. They had to report what the government was saying, saying we're winning. Yes. Uh, 44 days of winning, and then at the end, we lost everything. Uh, so it's not that part is not the fault of journalists. The government did not allow them. Yeah. Just like now, because yeah, there's I was a talking to the journalists, they were they couldn't say anything. Right, because they're not allowed to. Yeah. Because they'll be punished. And uh, well, even lately, they passed some law about journalism. I I don't know what they call them. I forgot about it. Yeah. The well, well what they passed. Uh, uh, is they, uh, you know, there's just like in the U.S. there are laws against defamation and libel. Uh, when you write something about somebody that's not true, you can be sued. What the uh, Pashinyan's people in parliament did, they raised to a large amount the penalty for uh, libel or defamation. So if, if uh, it's 5,600, I think now, dollars, in case a newspaper writes something that's uh, wrong and defames somebody, and eleven thousand dollars something, and if if, if it's uh, I think defamation or libel, one of them, and a uh, lot of the uh, European and American uh, organizations they criticized Armenia, saying that you are uh, not allowing the journalists the freedom to write what they want, and by raising such high penalty fees on journalists, you, you are muzzling the freedom of expression. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very sensitive issue because on one hand, you don't want newspapers to just blindly uh, uh, defame people and make up stories, which they do all the time. And in fact, I'm surprised that having these laws, whether the penalty is low or high penalty, every day that I follow the media in Armenia, I see so many false stories in the media that are politically uh, targeting their opponents and, and hardly ever anybody gets sued. In fact, there was a report I just read saying that this last year there were less lawsuits on defamation and libel than the year before. <laughs> it should be just the opposite because I think, I think journalists should be professional, they should be objective. They should not libel or defame anybody without any proof. And if they violate the person's uh, integrity, uh, and then they're they're guilty, and you know they they're taken to court, and they, they if they're found guilty, they have to pay the penalty. Uh, but I'm afraid the way our mean government is going, and 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 this is being done by a prime minister who all his life was a journalist, so yeah. he should have a little more sympathy for journalists than what he's doing. Because pretty soon, the next thing they're going to do is they're going to criminalize, criminalize uh, libel and defamation. Uh, for example, in the United States, if you write some falsehood against somebody in, in the American papers, they will take you to court and, and you pay a penalty. But they don't come and arrest you and put you in jail for, for defamation of character. But uh, in Armenia, I'm afraid that's going to be next, that they're going to arrest people. And... The, uh, also in the text of the law, it says that uh, a newspaper has to print all the names of all the donors to that newspaper. Uh, uh, that's really, uh, again, good going to an extreme yeah. because already newspapers are businesses and as businesses, they, they file their taxes with the government and they show all their income how much was given by who. So the government already knows all that information. Uh, it's really going overboard uh, to publish in the pages of the newspaper the names of the donors to the newspaper. He's, he's going slowly but surely or the gone way. He's going to nationalize probably all the medias that he doesn't like, you know. Yeah. If well, probably he, if he win, that's probably next 
is going to go after the journalist. Well, yeah, I mean, Erdogan has done a lot of very bad things. Uh, has a couple of hundred journalists in jail. It's shut down TV stations, newspapers. Nobody now dares to write a word against him. And in fact, just a couple of days ago, because Erdogan is trying to improve his relations with Egypt, he just uh, gave orders, strict orders, to uh, a couple of his own uh, newspapers and TV stations saying, you can no longer criticize Egypt or I will punish you. So again, you know, th this is very uh, outrageous interference yeah. in the freedom of expression and journalism. And, and uh, I hate to see Armenia go in that direction. Yep. It's every, everything they're doing going, you know, in my opinion, maybe I'm wrong, Without Armenia a victory, I don't care how much their economy improve, this, this weight that Pashinian put on Armenia and Armenians all everywhere, this depression, uh, it's got, we, ha we haven't got away from gone, uh, what happened in 100 years ago to our parents, grandparents, what happened to them, and now this one, and it's, I just don't know how we could recover from this without a victory. Uh, but I don't know, Armenia doesn't have that power, but hopefully someday they could do well, that. Well, let, let me repeat what I said earlier and then make a recommendation to every Armenian. Again, because we are a weak nation and we have an incompetent leader, that country will not get anywhere. In fact, every day that passes will get worse for us. Our enemies are not getting any weaker. We're the ones who are weak and getting weaker. So knowing that we're weak, we're surrounded with powerful enemies, and knowing that we don't have a leader who can do anything about it, improve the situation. What we need is the following. Right now, Armenians all over the world and all Armenians in, in Armenia, regardless of which, what side they're on, opposition, government, etc., we should put everything aside all our complaints, disagreements aside, all other projects aside, we should have only one objective for the whole Armenian nation. We should focus all our energies and resources into creating a militarily powerful, strong Armenia. We should have drones, the most advanced drones. If we can't produce them, we should raise the money and buy them. I'm sure Israel would love to take our money and buy us the drones that they have, that they, they sold it to Azerbaijan. The, we, we, should, we should have missiles, we should have drones, we should have jets, not the jets that Pashinyan bought without missiles, <laughs> but jets with missiles. Yeah. And uh, we should have uh, special uh, systems that will paralyze the, uh, the communication of the enemy so they cannot uh, target you. All the sophisticated stuff, that's how you win a war. But Armenia doesn't have any of those things. You know, before the war, two, four months before I had my video, I don't know if you saw or not, that Armenian exile force, you know, I think I don't want to talk now about this. You should come next week. We could merge my idea and your ID, Armenian ID or high ID together. Because to be honest with you, I don't have any more faith with Armenians. I really don't know. I met so many of them from villages. I interview actors and actresses, the member of parliament. When you talk to them, they're the most smartest people in the world. But when you come to action, zero. You know, so we diaspora have to do something different. We cannot really, we, I know many times you said, well, we need a government, we need a, a country where they said the United Nations, but you know what? They are 30 years, they keep going backward. And so we need, diaspora have to start doing, taking care of themselves, and that way they could help Armenia. But I just don't trust anymore Armenia. I honestly, I don't trust anymore. I'm sorry to say that. Well, um, I, I don't want to give any negative messages about Armenia, especially these days when everybody's in deep depression and we need to hear some good news. So let's, let's just motivate Armenians. Let's motivate everybody 
to put all their internal disagreements aside and focus on one thing. 10 million Armenians focus on how to make Armenia militarily stronger. Let's put everything else aside. That could and work if listen. there is some new face. But if Pashinyan come back, there's nothing you could do. You cannot motivate people. But if Pashinyan goes and there is some new face, as good as bad, at least we could rally behind it. But if Pashinyan come, how how you rally? No, I agree. I, I agree. We, that's why we need the uh, uh, fresh faces, uh, new people, new blood uh, to motivate people, to uh, create enthusiasm, to know that uh, the past is behind us. Let's look forward, but but let's not do it but by bad mounting uh, our homeland because our homeland is much a, much bigger than any one leader. Those leaders come and go, but the homeland and the people stay. And we need to uh, really uh, take care of our, our people and our homeland. The only way to do it by being strong, by being intelligent and making the right decisions uh, so that we're not in the shape that we have been, that we are now. You know, uh, th three years ago, I was in, they call it Digitech, you know, the technology things. They mm -hmm. had at that time, they were had robotic stuff, 3D printing, and there were some many... Uh, uh, drones, but never materialized. Well, they, they pushed it. I know. The, there, there's a lot of questions about about the war, and a lot of people have said a lot of things. We, we need a, a full investigative committee uh, uh, of, composed of experts and professionals, not polit political people, one side or the other, to come to the bottom of what happened. For example, Armia did have drones. Because uh, I remember a few years ago, I was in Armenia, and Armenia had shut down an Azeri drone back then. It's like five, six years ago. And they shut it down, not by a, with a missile, but just turning off their electronic system. So the Azeri drone landed in Armenia completely intact, not damaged. So they, they brought it to a factory in, in Yerevan, and they took me there. And they said, you cannot... Uh, disclose the location of this factory, and I have not, uh, so that it will not become a target of attacks by the enemy. So they took that drone apart and they were building similar drones, and they had built several drones. But now some people are saying, and I don't know if it's true or not, that Armenia did not use its drones during the war. And if it did not, why not? Yeah. Uh, so there are a lot of questions, serious questions, that uh, you don't know anymore who to believe and who not to believe. You, you need a professional investigation to... to We've been five, five months. We have no single investigation. It's most, uh, most horrible, uh, you know, a disastrous war. People died, land lost, all that stuff. There is no investigation. Well, it's, it's very important to have an investigation. Yes. Not because we want to rehash the past or not because we want to uh, necessarily blame Pashinyan or anybody else. There's a key reason. The key reason for investigation is so the country will learn from its mistakes, will learn lessons from its mistakes and not repeat them. If we don't learn, we, if we don't know what went wrong, we're going to do the same thing over and over yeah. again yeah. with the same result. So, so we need the investigation. It's very important to, to have a professional, uh, unbiased investigation. I think that investigation will happen if you have new face, new leader, that's all things we're talking will happen. But if Ashinian face come, he's, he's not going to investigate. Well, he already I'm, promised the military he was not investigating. Yeah, well, Ashinian obviously cannot investigate himself that's because right. we, know the, the, we know the verdict that he's going to say not guilty. I've done everything right. Yes. Which is something he says every day. So we need, we need uh, objective, neutral parties, professionals who come in, uh, whether they come from Armenia or from uh, outside of Armenia, Arme diaspora Armenians or non-Armenians, professionals, they come and objectively study and say what went wrong and, and what we need to correct. That's the most important thing, to correct our mistakes. Like, for example, uh, as I said earlier, we have three military chiefs of staff right now. That's yes. something you cannot do. I mean, I'm not a military guy, but even I know, a child knows that you can't have 
three leaders giving uh, three different orders. Yeah. Uh, so we have a lot of problems, yes, but but we should not give up on Armenia. It's our homeland. We, we've, we've lived thousands of years and uh, we've survived and hopefully we'll survive this terrible situation we're in and try to make it a better country, a stronger country. So now we're in election. We haven't seen other parties. So let's make once a week we talk about this election, where it's going, who is saying what, and follow uh, every day to the election stuff. So once a week, we like to invite you. We talk about election because you you understand their accent, their language, even though I follow some stuff. So we could talk about it and we'll feed this stuff election night every day, every day, every week. One day we we use it for that. OK, well, let, let, let's a deal. To... OK. All right. Thank okay, you. Well, thank you very much for coming. This was really, really very good information. I hope people who are watching, uh, we enlighten you. We give you some information that you could uh, digest. And uh, hopefully you could help Armenia some way or get rid of Pashinyan one way or another, bring us some new face. Again, thank you for viewer. We appreciate it. And thank you, Harut. And uh, we'll see you in next episode.